Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this this month's Footsteps to Mars Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, and I work at DeepAstronomy.com. And every month, we try to talk a little bit on the first Thursday of every month about going to Mars. And today, we have a special guest, Dr. Pascal Lee, who works at both the Mars Institute and the SETI Institute. And we're going to be talking about the moons of Mars today. We're going to talk about what they're like, what they are, you know, what they're made of, the sizes, and all kinds of their physical characteristics. And then we're going to talk about what they can do or what plans are in the works for perhaps exploring them when we go to Mars or even using them to help set up colonies and all kinds of really cool stuff like that. So we're going to get get going on. Uh, that's our topic today. And before I get started, I have to introduce my co-host, Dr. Harley Thronson. He is a astronomer, astrophysicist at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and he helps bring all these things together. Hi, Harley. Also, hey, good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, and also with his Dr. Alberto Conti. He's back. I love it when he can be here with us. He's a innovation scientist with Northrop Grumman. Hi, Alberto. And you are you are not at, in your home office. You're at your actual office today. So I'm in one, one of my offices in D.C. I'm very close to Harley, as I was mentioning before. Yes, it's great to be here, Tony. Yeah, cool. Well, welcome, guys. Okay, so let's talk about these Hangouts a little bit. These are endorsed by both the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronomical Society. And I'd like to have Harley tell you just a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish. Harley? Yeah, we've been doing this for about a year, I think a year and a couple of months. Uh, we have on the first Thursday of every month at this time, it is our Footsteps to Mars. Um, as uh, one of the recent NASA administrators said, we are closer to going to Mars with humans than we have been at any time in the past. And what we've been bringing forward on these once a month um, hangouts is uh, uh, individuals, groups, t small teams, and so on, who will present and discuss with us um, technology, concepts, science, goals, some specu highly speculative, some, some grounded totally in reality aspects of uh, human and robotic exploration of Mars. And now, a bit of an introduction to this one. Um, uh, most, not all, but most of the presentations uh, uh, in this Footsteps to Mars series has been about exploration of the exciting and the intriguing red planet. However, as the um, as scenarios for human exploration of Mars developed, um, a number of folks, um, scientists, engineers, technologists, have been um, urging individuals, have been arguing very persuasively that some serious consideration be given to the, their ex, the, in, the interesting and intriguing and challenging uh, moons of Mars. That's today's conversation. We have awesome. an expert in the field. Great. Okay. And so while these are endorsed by the American Astronomical and Astronautical Societies, the views and opinions expressed in here are not necessarily endorsed by these guys. And we want you to ask questions and comments for our guests. If you have any, there's three ways to do it. Deepastronomy.com slash live. I have a live chat uh, client going. Uh, people are starting to show up on that as well as the live chat client on YouTube. And finally, you can use the Footsteps to Mars hashtag on Twitter and I will do that. And I will read your comments and questions out later on in the Hangout. And so let me go ahead and introduce our guest. He is a uh, is Dr. Pascal Lee. He is a planetary scientist at, and he's the chairman at the Mars Institute and he is a senior planetary scientist at the SETI Institute. He is also an author of the book, Mission Mars, which you can get on Amazon, by the way. I just saw that, so <laughs> that's pretty cool. So welcome to our Hangout, Dr. Lee. Hey, just call me Pascal. It's good to be here. Oh, Pascal, okay, good. I will, I will call you that. So let's, we're here to, so you, study Mars, you, you think about getting to Mars all the time, and today we want to talk about the moons of Mars. So give us a little background on what these things are and why they're so interesting. Well, the moons, Mars has two moons. We have one moon uh, that we know of, the, the, the object that we now call, of course, the moon. Mars has two moons, and they are much smaller than our moon. They look like little asteroids. And the two moons of Mars uh, were actually discovered by an American astronomer, uh, Azaf Hall from the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington. And they were discovered in 1877, so over 100 years ago. And meanwhile, uh, these two worlds are, are still big mysteries because as much as we know that Mars and uh, the other uh, planet 
uh, Mercury, we know, we know what they are. They are planets. We also know what asteroids are. We know what comets are. We still have no idea what Phobos and Deimos are. Phobos and Deimos, those are the two names of the, of the moons of Mars. Phobos uh, is the inner moon. It's very close to Mars. Uh, Deimos is the outer one. Now, uh, it's really mysterious because, uh, of course, we know that they are moons, but we don't know where they c come from. And there are still uh, competing theories about how they formed and where they come from. And these competing theories are really challenging uh, our knowledge and understanding of, of the solar system, of the evolution of planets, and, and of how moons form. Uh, but before we get into the theories of, of what they might be, uh, I just wanted to talk a little uh, sort of what they are like. And, and so you can see this chart that uh, Phobos, the inner moon, is really very close to Mars. In fact, Phobos is 42 times closer to Mars than our own moon is close to the Earth. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an, an incredible proximity. Uh, it's still not what you would call low Mars orbit. Uh, it's what you would call high Mars orbit, being where Phobos is. But nevertheless, it's, it's very close to, to Mars. Uh, and then Deimos is farther out. Uh, and both of these little moons are on roughly circular orbits. And these orbits are also in the plane of Mars's equator. Okay, so if you're at the poles of Mars, uh, you don't see Phobos. It's too close to the equator uh, to, for you to be able to see Phobos. If you're at the poles of Mars, however, you do see Deimos because it's, it's far enough out there. Um, so these are not inclined at all. They're just they're, they go right above no, the, the equator. That's they, interesting. They are equatorial, and that's actually one of the mm. key mysteries as to how they might have formed. Because uh, there are some processes, like one of the ideas. I'll just jump right into it: is that they might be captured asteroids. Well, a capture process is very unlikely to end up putting you on a circular and equatorial orbit around the planet. Uh, it right. Would put you on some sort of a random orbit. Uh, and so the fact that these two moons are both equatorial and on circular orbits is, is, a, is part of the mystery. But uh, again, so before I go are, further... Pascal, can I ask you a question just yeah. before you go, actually? What yeah. are the relative sizes of Phobos and Deimos to, relative yeah. to Mars, and how do they compare to Earth, Earth's moon? So, so we'll, we'll get to that in actually the, very quickly. But uh, <laughs> Alberto, allow me to just... Uh, go, 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 go. Because I'll have some pictures. I have some pictures to show you that. Um, Phobos and Deimos uh, are, Phobos is so close to Mars that it's actually orbiting faster than Mars spins on itself. Mars spins on itself in 24 hours and 37 minutes. Uh, I don't That's know about one you, day but if on I Mars. Was, yes, one day on Mars is almost uh, like a day on Earth. Uh, it's 37 minutes longer. And like I said, I don't know about you, but I could, I could use 37 more minutes per day yeah. uh, to get things done. Definitely. But orbits around Mars goes one circle around Mars in seven hours, uh, and 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 then some. And so, uh, it's uh, therefore Phobos will rise at any given point on Mars about three times a day, and set three times a day. Okay, Deimos, on the other hand, is orbiting farther out and therefore moving more slowly. Uh, it orbits around Mars in roughly thirty hours or so, uh, and so. Uh, yeah, it, more slowly than Mars revolves around, it uh, rotates around itself or spins. And so therefore, you will only see one Deimos rise and one Deimos sunset uh, uh, set per, per day. Okay. Now, so what's this, uh, uh, interesting... Uh, oh, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that no, so you got, if it's in this circle, it's going very fast several times. You said three times or so per day, whereas here right. it's less than right. once per day. But here on this dotted line, right. you would... It, Explain this a little bit, if it were here on this dotted line. Yeah, this, this dotted line is the equivalent of the geostationary orbit that we have on the Earth. On the Earth, uh, at, a, at a radial distance from the center of the Earth of 36,000 kilometers above the equator, you have what we call the geostationary orbit. It is that orbit along which your, the time you would take to go around the Earth would be exactly 24 hours. Okay, so this is why we put weather satellites... Uh, communication satellites, any satellite that you want to have essentially hovering over the uh, same point above the Earth uh, is put at the geostationary orbit above the Earth's equator. Okay? Right, that's right. on the Earth at 36,000 kilometers from the center of the Earth. 
On Mars, the geostationary uh, orbit is much closer to Mars, and in fact, it happens to be between Phobos and Deimos. But if you are an astronomer and looking at these two moons, what this tells you immediately is that Phobos is doomed to forever spiral inwards towards Mars, whereas Deimos is doomed to forever spiral away from Mars. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, so they're, they're actually, one's falling in, the other one's being kind of flung out a little bit. Well, that's right. Our moon, because it's beyond the Earth's geostationary orbit, it's, it's uh, at kilometers from the Earth, approximately, uh, far beyond 36,000. Uh, our moon is drifting away at, at a rate of a few you know, um, uh, millimeters per day. Uh, but it's, it's drifting away, whereas uh, only Deimos is drifting away from Mars. Phobos is slowly drifting in. Wow. And so there will be a point at which uh, Phobos will eventually... Uh, fall onto Mars, and of course, b before that happens, it will break up into a ring of debris around Mars. Cool. Okay, well, we also have, so this goes to what Alberto was asking about it here just a minute. Uh, we have, yeah. uh, here's a picture of a comparison of all of these. These are pretty tiny, these are pretty tiny objects, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, so Alberto asked a very good question, so I want to bring up this slide and then the next one eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a slide comparing how, on the right, what the moon looks like from the Earth. So we're familiar with that. We see the moon, you know, very often. Uh, and on the left is how Phobos and Deimos would appear uh, in terms of their size uh, from, from Mars, would appear to be like. So Phobos is actually quite big. It's disk resolved. In other words, if you're at the surface of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, in spite of how small they actually are, uh, they, they are not just dots of light. They are resolved into... Uh, bodies that you know on which you can see features craters and, and structures so phobos would be spectacular still from from surface of mars deimos tends to recede into uh, being a, a very smaller blob uh, out there now while we're looking at this picture can i just ask is it possible it, you can actually get this picture in the same frame can't you these aren't like take copying and pasting a picture of phobos and a picture of deimos and then putting them in the same image because you said they both go around the equator we can actually that yes. one Phobos will be passing by many times in front of Deimos, right? So you could actually get this in one yeah. photo. Exactly. Oh, the frame on the left that shows you Phobos and Deimos happens to capture Phobos and Deimos close to each other in terms of their angular uh, sort of uh, distance, how far apart they appear to be in the sky. But of course, at, at times, Deimos is not at all where just behind Phobos, it, it can be on the other side of the planet. Um, but what's remarkable here is that. For this, this view is actually a, a picture that was taken by Curiosity. Uh, and you can immediately tell from this picture that Curiosity is near the equator of Mars because yeah. it was able to see Phobos, uh, Deimos being eclipsed by Phobos. Okay, so Deimos is about to overtake Deimos here in this, in this, Phobos is about to overtake Deimos in this picture. And this was captured by mm -hmm. Curiosity. And for Curiosity to be able to see this eclipse, it has to be near the equator itself. All right, and we uh, we've yeah. talked in, in past uh, in past hangouts about where Curiosity is and what it's exploring right now. So, uh, okay, well, let's see. You want to talk a little bit about this one now, or well, we can go on to the next. So, this yeah. is uh, answering more directly the great question that Alberto asked: How big are these guys? Well, let's look at what's at the upper left first, just to put things in perspective. Okay, tiniest thing you see is the ISA the internet. It's about 100 meters uh, across, okay? And next to it, to the left of it, I've, I've put a little picture of the asteroid Itokawa, which was explored by the Japanese uh, spacecraft Hayabusa. And Itokawa is about 500 or so meters long, okay? so five, five to six times longer uh, than the ISS. Deimos and Phobos are shown here at the same scale, okay? So... You can see, first of all, that Deimos is actually a very large ball body, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, compared to Itokawa. And then Phobos is even even bigger. Okay? Uh, so, so this gives you a sense of how small the ISS might be, uh, but at the same time how close it is, in fact, in size to, to some of these moons. Uh, one way to look at Phobos and Deimos is to view them as giant space stations in space. Uh, you know, if you 
if you were traveling through space in, in a spaceship the size of the ISS, uh, Phobos, you know, sort of looks like the Death Star. Uh, yeah, it does like a little that. bit, doesn't it? <laughs> but that, that okay. brings up another question, which you might actually talk about later, which is the shape of these moons is doesn't look like our moon, right? They're not as uh, spherical. Yeah, as so very good points. And in fact, I'm going to talk about it now because uh, these are irregular shaped objects, uh, sort of in the nomenclature of astronomers, you call them small bodies because they're still relatively small compared to, to the moon. Phobos is 17 miles long, okay? Uh, so about 27 kilometers long and then uh, Deimos is about nine miles long okay so just to give you uh, a sense of of uh, how big these guys are so uh, now you also notice that these two images were taken by Viking Viking orbiter one and two were among the spacecraft that came closest to Phobos and Deimos even to this day Viking orbiters were the first spacecraft to to not only achieve orbit around Mars uh, well, following Mariner 9, which also orbited Mars, but they, they released landers, and we're, we're very familiar with the Viking 1 and 2 lander pictures mm -hmm. of the surface of Mars, but the orbiters came very close to both Phobos and Deimos, and, and they took these spectacular pictures of these moons. Uh, what you see, uh, however, here is that these two worlds are different. They look different. Phobos is pretty rugged. It's got large craters, small craters, and it's crisscrossed by these networks of striations that are called grooves. Okay, so Phobos is a groovy place. Uh, Deimos, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I had to get that in. <laughs> and the big, the big crater that you see here at the, at um, this here. The, yeah. yeah, this one. Death Star. Uh, it's called. That's the Death Star crater. Okay. That crater is the largest crater on Phobos. It's about eight kilometers across. Okay, so a little, almost as wide as Deimos is. Uh, it's named, it's called Stickney. Stickney was the maiden name of Azaf Hall's uh, wife. Uh, but she actually had a, an important role in history. She was, um, at the time, women were not allowed to be, you know, uh, professors and astronomers. But meanwhile, she was a very capable mathematician. She was Azaf Hall's grad student at some point, uh, and she uh, eventually became uh, his wife. But she actually was a very important figure in, in helping Azaf Hall make his astronomical observations, and in particular to discover Phobos and Deimos. She, for one thing, encouraged him, pushed him uh, to, to observe further into the night uh, to, to, to find these to find any moon around Mars, and sure enough, that perseverance uh, is, is what allowed Azaf Hall to eventually spot Deimos and Phobos. Now, you said he worked so, at the Naval Observatory, right? Right. And did he right. use the telescope there, or what? What? what yes. Okay. Yes. So at the time, uh, the Naval Observatory had had a one of the largest refractive telescopes in in the world. Uh, Azaf Hall was a mathematician appointed by Abraham Lincoln, uh, and he was also dabbling into astronomy a bit as an amateur, but he had telescope time. And he would do things that nobody was interested in, such as looking for moons of Mars. And sure enough, his nobody perseverance paid off. <laughs> nobody cared. Well, I guess. You know, ironically, Mars was predicted to have two moons uh, much earlier in sort of the equivalent of sci-fi novels of their days uh, back in the uh, 18th century. Uh, Jonas, Jonathan Swift in, in Gulliver's Travels mentions that the astronomers in this uh, colony called Laputa were aware that Mars had two moons. And then uh, almost 100 years later, Voltaire in uh, Micromagus, it's another sort of philosophical novel, uh, was also taken for granted that the astronomers of the time knew of two moons of Mars. And this was, this was about 150 years before they were actually discovered. So wow. it's it's sort of amazing that, uh, that this from. this prescience uh, was was uh, so correct, wow. um, but of course the predict the the orbits that were described were not quite correct, uh, but they were not only predicted to exist as two moons, but they were predicted to be small bodies, small worlds, so small that they would be very difficult to see from the Earth, and so it's 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 quite extraordinary that uh, that uh, Mars turns out to have these two moons. Having said that, I want to point out immediately before I forget to say it that 
these are the two known moons of Mars. Uh, dynamically, it's actually possible that Mars could have s additional smaller moons, and it's really an amazing possibility. Uh, uh -huh. The environment of Mars is very difficult to observe close in because of how bright Mars is. And so, you know, you, it's like looking for exoplanets around a very bright star. Uh, you know, you, you'd have to do some eclipsing experiments. But, of course, for Mars, it's very difficult because the, the light coming from Mars is not constant to begin with. Yeah, but, here's a good, here's a good uh, illustration of that. Uh, I just want to be, you're talking about how bright Mars is compared to, say, the moon. Yeah. Just a good example. So, so these moons are extremely dark. Thank you for moving me along. Uh, this is Phobos against the backdrop of Mars. Wow. Mars uh, has a re reflectivity, in other words, it reflects about 20%, 20 to 25% of the, of the light that's coming in from, from the sun. Uh, Phobos and Deimos reflect about 6 to 7%. They are as dark as asphalt. And wow. we, as much as we've seen some beautiful color pictures that are super enhanced of Phobos and Deimos, you know, we're showing reds and blues, uh, we should bear in mind that if you were an astronaut approaching Phobos, looking out the window with your uh, sort of visible uh, wavelength eyes, uh, you would be looking at gigantic lumps of coal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, they're that so dark. Th these oh are the, the these are briquette worlds. <laughs> I was gonna actually. This is great. I, di I didn't realize that people are still thinking that there could be other potential moons, I guess. So are they looking, for example, at gravitational signatures on these two bodies that are being perturbed perhaps by other bodies? Uh, we're, we're not looking for them gravitationally. Uh, the, the search for additional moons was attempted by Mark Showalter at the SETI Institute and also Douglas Hamilton, who's at the University of Maryland. Uh, they have, they've used HST observations, oh, wow. uh, blocking the light of Mars and looking at yeah. the, the surrounds. And so far, here are the constraints. There's, there's nothing between Deimos and Phobos that's larger than 10 meters. Oh, I see. Sorry, sorry. Nothing beyond Deimos beyond, that's beyond, larger yeah. than, than yeah. 10 meters. Nothing hmm. between Deimos and Phobos that's larger than 100 meters. But you could have a rock that's 90 meters across that's still... Yeah. Okay. That's pretty sizable. Well, that And then below, below Phobos, you could still have things that are several hundred meters across. And not be seen. Detected. And not yeah. be seen, not be known. And all the spacecraft that we've sent to Mars to orbit Mars are all looking down because they're looking at Mars. They would not have captured. Uh, no, I understand. But my question is, wouldn't they perturb the orbits of the others, of Deimos and Phobos? I think they'd be too small. Very little. Yeah. They're okay. too small. They're very high up. And the perturbations from Mars itself are more significant. Uh, yeah. So um, You left us, uh, P Pascal, you're establishing some terrific mysteries. I'm going to go back to the very first one, that the, the remarkable orbits, Copeland yeah. in, the, yeah. in the equator, and, and, I, and I know by basic dynamics, it is really tough, in fact, virtually impossible, to capture something into an orbit like that. So what are the... Uh, what are the theories or hypotheses around so where they came? The three, there are three main competing theories, and there are you know variants of each of the three. But theory number one, which is sort of the simplest, is that Deimos and Phobos are the leftovers of the formation of Mars itself. Mars formed from the accretion of a cloud of gas and dust and uh, planetesimals. Well, and most of these planetesimals, these little objects essentially asteroids that were uh, captured, if you will, to, to form Mars were all from the inner solar system, where most of them were from the inner solar system. And so the idea here is that Phobos and Deimos are leftovers, remnants from Mars's own formation. That's, that's interesting as an idea because it, it predicts a few things. It predicts that their overall composition is similar to Mars's overall composition. Right. Not the rocks at the surface of Mars, because those have been chemically differentiated, but if you take Mars as a whole, and Phobos and Deimos as a whole, one test is, is do, these, do these three bodies have the same overall chemical composition, down to not just the atoms, but the isotopes as well. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the second, uh, and of course, it was thought that this idea would, would imply very little water in them. Although now we think that the terrestrial planets, including Mars, would have formed with quite a bit of water to begin with from the material around them, not just brought in by comets later. But 
that's uh, the water story. The second idea, the second idea is that they are captured. They're captured asteroids, or more specifically or more vaguely, they are captured small bodies from the outer main belt or beyond. And the reason why we think that they might be that is because both have spectra that look a lot like the spectra of asteroids that we see in the outer part of the main belt, in the outer part of the solar system. Uh, the spectra of both Phobos and Deimos is relatively red. Okay? And I, I'm going to skip through this plot because it, only, it just tells you that they're red. Okay, But let's go back to the previous slide. Uh, this is a picture. Okay, so maybe the next one. Yeah. Yeah. This one? This is showing you. Yep. This is showing you an enhanced color version of Phobos. The Deimos is even redder, but basically these are relatively red, uh, small bodies, and this redness is characteristic of a type of small bodies that we find in the outer part of the solar system, and so in the outer part of the main belt, main asteroid belt. Okay, so so this is where this whole idea that they might be primitive objects captured by Mars comes from. But as you pointed out uh, as well, it's very difficult it, from a dynamical standpoint to explain how small bodies coming in from that far out could be captured. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now there are, okay, it's just very difficult. Uh, you don't capture something, you either spin to Mars and then now you're stopped and you're looking up or you are flung away from, by Mars. You don't get captured easily, let alone captured in a nice circular orbit that's equatorial. Yeah. Uh, so there are ways to get around that, that that are complicated, but one scenario is that they broke up in the process. So whatever was coming from the outer main belt or beyond uh, broke up because it was loose, loosely bound to begin with as it flew by Mars, and then now it entered into collisions with other things that were in orbit on Mars, and then you end up capturing uh, what turns into a ring of debris in Mars orbit that then reassembles into something that is reddish in color but it's not quite a primitive body per se it's sort of already a, uh, a reassembled pile of of primitive material all right so that's that's hypothesis number two hypothesis number three is radically different it's similar to how we think our own moon formed today mars would have been hit by a large object early in its history a giant impact the giant impact would have flung into orbit around Mars, a ring of debris. This ring of debris would have essentially reaccreted, at least part of it would have reaccreted into small bodies. And these would have been equatorial and circular by now because when you have a ring of debris, it's a lot easier to sort of manipulate how you evolve orbitally and in terms of plane inclination over time, okay, as opposed to a large object to begin with. So. So the, the notion here is that Phobos and Deimos would not be made of primitive material from the outer solar system or primitive material that was near Mars when Mars fo itself formed, but material that is made mostly of Martian crust, evolved material from the surface of Mars that got flung into space by this giant impact. And so that's a testable idea as well, except that to test any one of these three ideas, you need to get samples, really because from a spectral standpoint, they, they tend to give you a very confusing and ambiguous result. Okay. I need to stop real quick, just to interrupt real quick and say, you are watching the Footsteps to Mars Hangout. We do this every uh, every month on the first Thursday of every month on Deep Astronomy. And we are talking about the moons of Mars, uh, Phobos and Deimos. And my guest today is Dr. Pascal Lee. He's a planetary scientist and a chairman at the Mars Institute. And he's also a senior planetary scientist at SETI Institute. He's also the author of the book, Mission Mars. And while we're before, I want to I want to move from what Mars, what, what what Phobos and Deimos are to what we can, what how they can help us with uh, Martian exploration. But before I leave it, I want I, there's some great comments and questions I want to get to on the topic. Uh, Hans Milling is uh, was asking. He goes, he says, if they are smaller, if they're any, if they get any smaller, they are just big rocks. He, he was talking. You were talking about these smaller bodies that would be uh, perhaps there that we can't see yet. And he's asking, yeah. what classifies a moon? Ah, uh, well. 
that that enters that opens the whole can of worm of what uh, a planet is as well. Uh, I will just refer. And we know what the, a planet is now, thanks to the takes of Pluto and the yeah. IAU. <laughs> Not Pluto. well, the IAU the IAU is likely to have to change its definition on it because uh, Alan Stern and some of his teammates are now proposing a new definition of what a planet is, and they're going to present that definition at the upcoming lunar lunar and planetary science conference, in Houston. Oh wow. Uh, but the bottom line is what constitutes a moon is, is any object of any size that is in orbit around something that would still be considered a planet. Okay? Uh, the, the big question is what then is called a planet? And I, I'd, uh, I'm not going to answer, I'm not going to be able to answer this question in a lot more detail than that for, for now. That's good enough. That's good uh, enough. Okay. Uh, just Larry. where Alan is going with this. Yeah, just to give you a sense of where Alan is with this which I think makes a lot of sense, uh, our own moon would be considered a planet. Uh, what, what a planet is described as a, as a large spherical spheroidal body Very that right. is not a star, essentially. Okay. And so our moon in this uh, def new definition would also be a planet, except that when you say that what makes it a moon, it's, it's the fact that it's in orbit. It's a so being a moon is a description of your orbit, not a description of what you're like. I see. It's where you are. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the good here's a good question from Larry Keese. You 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 also told us about the three uh, ideas of what these moons could be, and he's asking, did Stickney uh, cause the breakup of Phobos and then reaccrete? Could that be a possibility? Uh, it's it's unlikely. Uh, first of all, what forms Stickney uh, is still very unclear. I mean, it's obviously an impact. But it could have been a relatively small object if Stickney and Phobos itself were not very strong materials. Imagine, imagine that they're not very strong, that the whole of Phobos is not a very strong body, but uh, a, a pile of loosely bound uh, rocks, dust, and sand. Okay? Uh, if, a, if a small impactor comes in, it can actually generate a very large crater uh, because of this material being unbound uh, and yet not represent really a very... Uh, massive impactor. So the, the dynamics of impact cratering, I guess, is what I'm trying to explain on a small body is very counterintuitive. Uh, so so uh, Stickney, therefore, was not necessarily that massive of an impact to have disrupted Phobos or, or to have caused it to even fracture. Okay, It might have if Phobos was rigid, but if Phobos was a loose pile of rubble, no. <laughs> so Hans Melling is also commenting, and based on what you just said then about what a moon is, he says, ISS is a moon then, with a little happy smiley face. And then some guy named Alberto comes along and says, I guess they have to not be, uh, they, I guess they have to be not man-made. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, I mean, ISS is an artificial satellite, and that's yeah. what we call these things artificial satellites uh, from the get-go, yeah. Okay. We'll be a little for uh, the stress for the moon, yes. And finally, one more quick quick question before we leave this topic. Uh, Hans Milling also asks, why does it take? Why does you were talking about the um, the, the the way in which uh, uh, Phobos was constantly falling in towards uh, the Mars, and the other one is falling away? Uh, why? And this goes back to that discussion. He was asking, why does it break into a ring instead of crashing into the planet? Uh, why would why would the um, moon why yeah. would the moon break up into a ring first? Great question. Okay. So any, any moon, any elongated object, uh, like Phobos, for example, is subject to a differential in gravitational attraction. Uh, if you think about it, the, the side of Phobos that's near Mars is pulled in towards Mars at any given time more strongly than the far side of Phobos. It's true for even our own moon. Okay? So moons are, and space stations even, are stretched in some sense by differential, it's called a gravity gradient. The differential in gravity between the near side and the far side. And it, of course, it's, this gradient is happening all along continuously. Uh, at some point, if Phobos is a weak body, if it's not very cohesive, if it's like a pile of loosely bound rubble, at some point, this differential uh, gravitational pull from Mars overcomes the mutual gravitational attraction of, of these rubble elements that are forming Phobos itself. And so it's going to stretch until it breaks apart. It's going to just break up. And this is how you, you end up having a ring of debris uh, from a moon that, that, that breaks up. But let's say Phobos was really strong. 
mechanically strong, that it's continuously strong throughout, cohesive, well, it will never break up. And in fact, eventually it will just get so close to the upper Martian atmosphere that from drag, it will just fall into Mars and hit Mars as, as an object the size it is. Okay. Uh, okay, I want to move on to what we're going to do, uh, How what efforts are being made uh, to uh, maybe think about what Phobos and Demos can do to help us in our exploration of Mars. Now, you work at the Mars Institute. You're the chairman there, and you guys think about a lot of different things about how and what to get us, uh, what it would take to get us to Mars. How do these moons factor into your thinking? And I'm going to show this picture because I like it a lot while you're talking. Hang on just a sec here. Um, <coughs> the, the Mars Institute is interested in getting humans to Mars because that's the best way we're going to do science uh, this, to advance the scientific exploration of Mars. And uh, I, I wanted to, to mention something to actually segue from this discussion on the origin possibilities. Okay. These, these three main origin possibilities have different implications about how much water might be available inside Phobos and Deimos today. And there's even an extreme version of, of the origin theory, which is that Phobos and or Deimos could be essentially remnants of captured comets. Now, it's unlikely, but it's possible. It's part of the trade space. And if that were uh, a real thing, then the interior of Phobos could still contain, and of Deimos could still contain a lot of water. In, form, in the form of ice that you could just chip away at, but locked up in the mineral uh, structure of the, of, the, of the rocks that are making up these bodies, but also in the form of ice in, on the inside. So this is showing you just some ongoing research uh, that models the interior of Phobos, depending on the types of ingredients you include. Uh, we're using three types of elements, if you will, three types of components, rock, voids and ice and depending on what you assume for the composition of the rock whether it's dense rock or light rock depending on how much you assume in terms of amount of voids on the inside you can also constrain how much ice there could be and we're we're really uh, amazed by some outcomes of this modeling because uh, modeling a for example would make the inside consistent with these bodies being of a cometary origin they could be over uh, anywhere from 55 to 60 percent ice on their inside. Uh, so this blue really stuff, and that's what's supposed to be this blue stuff here? Yeah, this light colored uh, mm -hmm. shading on in model A is ice. Okay. Uh, that would be remarkable, and that's possible uh, from a physical standpoint based on what we know so far, which is not that much about Phobos and Deimos. It's, it's, still, a, it's still a plausible uh, and possible uh, structure for the inside. And one thing that really added fuel to this idea that they might be captured comets comes from the fact that if you, if you look at Phobos and Deimos from the standpoint of near-Earth asteroids or near-Earth objects, let's say you include them among these, these ob this family of objects that we call near-Earth objects that come close to the Earth and are essentially asteroids or comets. Okay. Phobos and Deimos uh, are, would rank number three and number five in size. Uh, in other words, they're, they're, they're among the largest small bodies we know of in the near-Earth uh, environment. And who's number four? Well, number four, as it turns out, is a comet. And it's a comet that has exactly the same spectral characteristics as Phobos and Deimos. Is that right? Okay. And wow. It's called cool. Don Quixote. 3552 Don Quixote is a comet. Uh, it's, it's labeled as an asteroid, but it's actually a comet. It's emitting CO2, uh, CO, H2O, uh, and it's of the same spectral type as Phobos and Deimos. And this is the slide that essentially illustrates that. You see, Phobos is number five, three in size, Deimos is number five. Number four is 3552 Don Quixote. We visited 433 Eros with Nier. Uh, there are no plans to go visit 3552 Don Quixote, but I would be really intrigued. Uh, to go check out uh, 3550 Don Quixote because it could be the link uh, to the origin of Phobos and Deimos and, and might actually confirm that they, they could be comets on the inside. And would say a lot about the water content that might be available so, to people trying to get there. 
So why are they important? I think the main thing to understand is that if you want to send people to Mars, which is what we want to do at the Mars Institute, and of course a large uh, fraction of the, the science community that explores Mars, the, if you look at getting humans to Mars, the bulk of the cost and complexity of getting humans to Mars lies in that part which takes you from low Mars orbit to the surface of Mars and back up. That's where the bulk of the cost of the mission to Mars is. You need a spacesuit that is light enough for the surface of Mars. You need habitats on Mars. You need rovers to be effective explorers on Mars. You need a whole infrastructure at the surface of Mars before you can be ready to really explore Mars. Meanwhile, going to Phobos and Deimos is something that, uh, from a cost standpoint, from a, a need to build hardware standpoint, is, is much more easy to do, much more uh, affordable to do. Uh, and from my perspective, going to Phobos and Deimos with humans, uh, even though you would not be landing on Mars itself, uh, it would serve as a catalyst to make uh, a human mission to Mars down the road happen faster and sooner. Okay, uh, so. So, hey, Pascal, can you elaborate on one thing, which I think is kind of key for for people, even for me, actually, to understand? Which is, why why do you think it's uh, it's uh, it's it's better, you know, probably co you know, in terms of cost, in terms of uh, uh, lots of other things, to go to the moons? You know, I mean, I guess the question is, you know, you're already ninety nine percent of the of the you've traveled ninety nine percent of the distance there. Why is it much harder to get to the surface of Mars as opposed because to staying on the asteroids? Because to go to the because to go to the surface of Mars, you have to enter deep into the Martian okay. gravity well. Uh, you get you get trapped down there, mm -hmm. and then you have to expand all that much rocket rocket fuel and energy to get back out of the depth of the Martian gravity well. Phobos and Deimos are skirting Mars, if you will. They are far out, and so the delta V actually to to just uh, use a, a measure of impulse, the uh, measure of how much. Uh, essentially fuel expenditure in some sense that you have to expand to, to get to Phobos and Nemo is, is actually lower than to get to the surface of our moon. Okay. If you want to land uh -huh. a pound, if you want to land a, mm -hmm. a, a pound of hardware cargo on Phobos or on Deimos, okay, the delta V that you have to expand to make that happen is less than if you have to land that same pound of cargo and hardware safely, softly at the surface of our moon. Because our moon is deep in its own gravitational well as well, and it's it's pretty sure. costly to slow yourself down to get there. Uh, so Phobos, ironically, are are harder to reach in terms of time, but they are easier to reach than the surface of our own moon in terms of uh, you know rocket fuel expenditure. Okay, I want to. So it's it's quite remarkable. We're running. We're starting to run out of time, and I want to get some of these comments and questions we're getting in. And this is related. Rain, Rainbow. Panda is asking a question related to the gravity well issue you're talking about. So maybe you can give us a little insight. He, she, or he or she says, sorry if this has already been uh, answered, but will astronauts be able to walk on the surface of Phobos or Deimos, or will they just bounce off into space due to the low gravity? Yeah, great question. The gravity on Phobos is 1,700 times less than on the Earth. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you, can, you can escape Diet. Phobos... You can escape Phobos. Uh, well, I also think going to Mars is a good weight loss program. But <laughs> having said that, that's uh, easy. Yeah, uh, uh, we can you can you, like can, that. you can escape Phobos by riding a bicycle uh, to thirty miles an hour. Okay, uh, so so that's how small these worlds are. On Phobos, if you push yourself hard on your legs, you can rise to about half a mile. Uh, in altitude, and of course you do so slowly, uh, and then eventually you would fall back down, and you would not hit the surface of Phobos harder than you would have pushed yourself off of it. Uh, so it would be an amazing uh, fun and challenge, of course, to, to explore a place like this. So one solution is to explore these l small gravity worlds, not just Phobos and Deimos, but any near-Earth asteroid or asteroid. Yeah. Uh, with jetpacks, okay. So we we have the MMU, the Man Maneuvering Unit, that was tested in the early '80s with the shuttle program. Uh, NASA stopped using them after Challenger because uh, they would have had to be recertified for for flight on the shuttle. Uh, but they, I spoke not too long ago with Bruce McCandless, who who's the first U.S. astronaut who actually flew a jetpack. Well, 
through the MMU, I should say, more specifically. And uh, was 100% on board using MMUs to, to explore small models like Phobos and Demons. So that, I think that would be the way to go. If you need to work actually at a spot on the surface, you might want to anchor yourself. So you could harpoon yourself or tie yourself to a boulder. Uh, and then otherwise, you're just uh, jetpacking around. And wow. You, be, incidentally, like you don't want to be... It's a lot of fun. You don't want to be uh, lifting, stirring up the dust either because both Phobos and Deimos are, are probably extremely dusty. We know that from radar data on the Earth. Uh, they... Uh, the data echoes are very muffled, if you will, so we know that uh, there's a lot of porosity in the regolith and the surface material of Phobos and Deimos, much more so than on other asteroids. When an asteroid gets hit by an impact, it tends to just blow off the dirt, and then you end up with a rocky uh, substrate that's exposed. On places like Phobos and Deimos, all that dirt that gets expelled by an impact eventually gets recollected on Phobos and Deimos over time because it's trapped around Mars. Uh, and so you end up with a rel relatively thick and powdery regolith on both on both bodies. Well, maybe a jet pack is not the best idea then. Uh, yeah, really. So the jet the jet pack is is to jet around without touching. Uh, you, you definitely I don't. See, I see, I see. It's sort of like uh, exploring the the floor of the ocean or the sea. You, you don't want to, you know, you can use a torpedo propeller thing to move around. So this is sort of the I understand. analog. Uh, yeah. But you don't want to stir up the silt. Okay. All right, so uh, Rainbow Panda, <laughs> I'm a guy, Tony. Ha <laughs> ha! I'm on Patreon. I actually knew that. I don't know why I said uh, he or she, but um, uh, but thank you for for clarifying. I did actually know that. Uh, here's one uh, question. I'm looking at the YouTube uh, live chat. Uh, dirty, dirty boy, sing to God is asking <laughs> question. <laughs> question for the panel: What are Demos and Phobos terrains like? Um, are they hard and rocky like some of the Jovian moons or more porous and dusty like our own moon? Now, you mentioned some stuff about regoliths and things like that. Do you yep. want to go further? Porous, dusty. Phobos is probably more rocky. Uh, you know, you, it might have some gravel at the surface as well as a lot of dust, uh, but uh, they, they are both uh, extremely porous places. Uh, Deimos uh, might actually be like fresh snow. Uh, or uh, something that follows an avalanche. So it has the same porosity, 60% porosity, which is huge, as, wow. as avalanche, f freshly avalanched snow. Wow. Uh, is is demo. Wow. So that's nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, in the early days of uh, planning moon landings on our moon, uh, people were, people like Tommy Gold, astronomers like Tommy Gold, were raised a concern that, you know, the landers might sink into the lunar dust. Uh, that turned out to be. Uh, not a real danger, uh, but it it actually is a danger in the case of Deimos and possibly Phobos. Uh, the fact that the Russians have tried to return samples and send spacecraft to Phobos on three occasions and have failed uh, has nothing to do with with uh, Phobos yet or Deimos. They they just haven't even reached those places, and I think the the fun is only about to begin uh, when it comes to to landing on those places. Well, that that comes to the question that Hans Milling is asking on the on the live chat side. He goes, "Why not send a Philae lander to study the moons?" And the Philae lander was the yes. lander that ESA sent to sixty seven the comet sixty seven P, and uh, they lost contact with it shortly thereafter. But they did attempt a landing. So anything like that in the works? I I'm with you entirely on this. Uh, we we should we should have a precursor mission to to not just study the science of these objects, but to plan. Uh, future human missions and incidentally one of the things that's remarkable about Phobos and Deimos is that they might be repositories of Martian rocks. Mars has been pelted by asteroids and comets over eons okay. all over Mars and debris kicked off from the surface of Mars not just from different locations but throughout time uh, might be partial might have partially been recollected on Phobos and, and maybe a little less on Deimos. Anyway Sifting through a, the sands and regolith of Phobos would be like uh, would be an incredible uh, boon from a scientific standpoint because not only would you have Phobos material obviously but but uh, possibly bits and pieces coming from all over Mars sampled from Mars throughout Martian history signs of life if life ever existed at the surface of Mars could be potentially better preserved in these fragments of Mars that are on Phobos today because they would have been vacuum sealed so to speak and uh, and protected from the Martian weathering 
uh, than stuff that's still sitting on Mars today. Wow. Now, early in the Hangout, you mentioned something about the orbital periods of these two moons, but did what about their spin? Do they also spin on their axes? We, we know they go around very quickly in a yes. matter of hours, but what about their spin? Yeah. Do they also do that? Both, both are synchronously locked, just like our own moon. So they, they both point. So both are elongated, somewhat football shaped. Uh, and so the same tip of the football is always pointing towards Mars, and then the other tip is always pointing away. There is a near side of Phobos and a far side of Phobos. There's a near side of Deimos and a far side of, of Deimos. Uh, and so they, they, so the, they spin, of course, but they spin at exactly the same rate as, as, they, re, as they revolve around Mars. Good. Okay, good. So David Conde, uh, Conte uh, is asking on YouTube, uh, what do you guys think of the idea of creating an interplanetary outpost on the surface of Phobos or Deimos to help exploring Mars and use it as a pit stop for further destinations? Now, you mentioned earlier that it, the gravity well makes it very easy to land here. Uh, is that the kind of thing you guys at the Mars Institute are considering? Yes, we, we, we want to understand the surface uh, of Phobos better before thinking of how we might design the infrastructure. But this is why a precursor mission is so important. We want to know how much water there might be on Phobos. We want to know what, what the terrain is like to see if we can build on it. But the idea, yes, is to use Phobos and Deimos as existing uh, platforms in, in Mars orbit uh, as space stations, essentially. Uh, and then uh, from these places, you could you could do things like uh, quarantine samples that are coming back from Mars before you, you send them on to the Earth. You, you could imagine a campaign of robotic missions collecting samples from all over Mars, bringing them to Phobos just to quarantine them, and then have a human crew high-grade these samples and then selectively pick the ones that need to be returned to the Earth for, for further analysis. Uh, there, there's a lot of... There's been a lot of discussion about how an outpost in Mars orbit, including on Phobos or Deimos, uh, could could help you teleoperate robots on Mars because you you would do away with the time delay uh, of being so far from Mars yeah, when you're on make Earth. Driving those rovers easier. Right. Yeah. So so that argument is often made, but the truth is, uh, the rate at which we are we're slowed down by rovers on Mars is has little to do with the time delay. We could easily program or create a rover that would be essentially zipping across the Martian surface. Uh, the reason why it takes so long for these rovers to cover a few kilometers is because of the scientists. The scientists are needing a lot of data, so I put myself in that category. We, we want a lot of data, so it takes time to send data back because the data rate is slow. So once we have laser comms, that's going to get better. But the other thing is that we sit on that data for weeks on end because we have to analyze it, uh, study it. So the bottleneck in terms of teleoperation on Mars is actually not really the time delay. I mean, <laughs> it, tough. it does it does impose some limits. It's really the scientific analysis of the data. Uh, so so being in orbit around Mars uh, would allow you, of course, to teleoperate things that somehow would need human intervention immediately. For example, drilling might need might need that if you had a robotic drill. So to intervene quickly, you might want to be close. Also, if you were flying a Mars airplane, uh, a robotic drone, for example, you could, you could imagine having an advantage by being in Mars orbit to, to fly it because being back on Earth, you can, you can control or respond to, its, to what it runs into. Uh, but but uh, other than that, rovers is actually not uh, that advantageous to, to teleoperate from Phobos or Deimos versus from the Earth. Okay, well, as you were describing that, the, 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 the bottleneck being the scientist interested in everything maybe reminded me of like when I walk my dog, I don't get very far down the road because every single smell is really interesting to him. And so he has to stop yes. and just examine. That's exactly everything. it. The, that's, <laughs> the that's a beautiful the analogy because the, the dog is, the, the rate at which your dog is moving is not a reflection of how fast it could actually run. That's right, exactly, because he can move. But uh, yeah, those of us does. that were raised with beagles, <laughs> yes. how long it takes to get around the block. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So Galaxia has a as a question. What has been discovered spectroscopically? And then she elaborates a little more, saying, "I mean, the molecules and the composition of the moons of Mars, and what were were there any overlaps uh, between the composition and uh, comets?" Now we showed that one diagram where you had different ideas of what might be inside but what have we learned spectroscopically and are we pretty much at the limit there uh, we are 
so the only compositional data we have at Phobos and Dima, we have no samples from them yet. The only compositional information we have is from spectra. And the spectra are oddly very ambiguous. We know that both are very red, like the asteroids in the outer solar system. So there is a there is a kinship. What well, one possible interpretation is that they are made of primitive materials, therefore a bit like primitive meteorites. And in fact, one of the meteorites that looks the most like Phobos and Deimos is called a meteorite that fell not too long ago in Canada called Tagish Lake. It's a carbonaceous chondrite. It's a primitive, water-rich meteorite. Uh, but the spectra is also consistent with Phobos and Deimos being made of more evolved materials, possibly even rock from the, the crust of Mars. Uh, however, not, not unaltered crustal rocks from Mars. The, the, the one complicating factor is that Phobos and Deimos are their materials are exposed to space, so there's space weathering going on. That's the pounding uh, of the surface by micrometeorites, but also the ejection of elements, atomic elements, by the solar wind. Uh, so lots of stuff is going on at the surface of Phobos that could be altering and the most that could be altering what they are really made of. Uh, the other thing is we might actually not be seeing much of what Phobos truly is. There's material drifting in from Deimos to Phobos at all times. And in fact, this is part of the reason why we think Phobos might actually be red only because Deimos is so red. And the true Phobos might only be exposed in this part of uh, Phobos that's very near the Cygni crater uh, because uh, that's where Phobos shows a strange color difference with the rest of itself. Uh, it's, it's less red. It's, it's called the bluer unit. Some people even call it the blue unit. It's not technically blue. It's less red, but substantially less, less red. It's, it's almost gray, whereas the rest of Phobos is very red like the rest of Deimos like all of Deimos. So, so we might be looking when we see that if we land on the red part of Phobos, which is most of Phobos, we might just be stepping on stuff that has drifted in from Deimos and not really getting access to Phobos itself. Okay, we are running out of time and I really want to get this question in. So if we can be brief on the answer, it would be great. But it's a good one. Philip W. is asking, question for Pascal. Uh, with radiation shielding being a current issue for Martian exploration, what kind of radiation would astronauts have to deal with on Phobos? Uh, they would be exposed to deep space radiation, so no protection, except if you are on the Mars-facing side of Phobos. If you're on the Mars-facing side of Phobos, Phobos is going to occupy such a big chunk of the sky, which is where the radiation is coming from, uh, that you are actually going to be relatively well shielded. First of all, being at the surface of any of these bodies, means that you only have now radiation coming from above as opposed to from 360 degrees uh, spherically. Uh, you're protected by the ground of Phobos itself, of course, by the mass of Phobos and Deimos. But on the Mars-facing side of Phobos, you have the added benefit of Mars being a gigantic uh, radiation shield, if you will, overhead. And Mars, just to give you a sense of how big it is, looming in the sky of Phobos, is, is 6,400 times larger 6,400 times larger in the sky of Phobos than our own moon uh, appears in our own sky. Okay, So that Earthrise photo that we saw from Apollo 8 or whatever it was, whichever one it was, would be huge if it did that same kind yes. of image on yeah. uh, Phobos. Wow. Yeah, I have a, times. I think I have a painting that illustrates, uh, maybe the last one, if you could show it. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, what Phobos might, what Mars might appear like if you were exploring uh, the Stickney crater on, on Phobos. Okay, let me put this up. Is it this one? Yes. Whoops, where'd my hangout go? I lost my hangout. Here we are. Is it this one? Let's see. Do you uh, see the it? The one before. Ah, the one okay. before. Just before. There we are. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so, wow. So here you are sort of at the edge, standing on one edge of the Stickney crater, and Mars is just looming in the sky like that, and you are jetpacking around, exploring a boulder, and you've landed on a surface that seems to be horizontal, but that makes absolutely no difference. Um, See, this is sideways. me, Alberto, and this is you here. You're that you're out there. Yeah. You. 
I okay. can see myself <laughs> tilting my head as I look at this. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay, well, we are out of time. I need to stop it there. Pascal, I did not get to talk to you about so many other things I wanted to ask. I want to talk about the Mars Institute itself, what it's like to be at SETI. Uh, any chance we SETI can get is to great. Mars yeah, I bet is it great. is. <laughs> well, we're going to get you back, right, Pascal? Yeah, any chance we can get you back hey. you know, to hang out. Anytime. Awesome. Anytime. Thank, you. Thank you so much for taking time out to be with us. That was Dr. Pascal Lee. He's a planetary scientist and chairman at the Mars Institute, and he's also a senior planetary scientist at the SETI Institute. He's written a book. It's on Amazon. It's on paperback, Mission Mars. So definitely check it out. And he's got oh, his book. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> And there is GW. Put it back up again. Yeah, there's the GW duck. We have GW, gravitational wave rubber ducky. Oh, that's sweet. I can bring air. There's tell you the what. waves of space time. Oh, we're going to get all of our animals in, I see. Okay. Uh, oh, we have kitty cats. Panther's right here. He's ready to eat. He's getting hungry. <laughs> there's, there's our, our, that's our, that's our Oreo oh, cat. And the Incredibles. That, that, and Alberto. <laughs> <laughs> that's really great. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you so much, Pascal. This has been a great hangout. Thank, Thank you, you, Pascal. About the moons Thank you. Mars and what they might be like to actually be on. And hopefully we'll get one of those Philae type landers to land on it soon. NASA, are you listening? We got to get that mission going so we can find out what these guys are made of. We appreciate it. Um, next week, we'll be back Thursday, three o'clock, where I'll have my co-host, Carol Christian, Dr. Carol Christian. We'll be here with our afternoon astronomy coffee. We're going to be talking about the bow shocks of stars. And uh, there's a lot there to, to, to go into. Like, will they hurt us? Who Can they hurt oh, that's us? That's cool. So, okay. So we hope you'll see you next week. Um, on behalf of all of my, all of our my guests on the Hangout, Dr. Pascal Lee, as well as Harley Thronson and Alberto Conti, thank you all for watching. And our pets. And our pet and their pet and buy and their pets. That's right. Thank you all for watching. And as always, thank you. Keep looking, keep up. looking up. Thank you.